hope that you might get the gist of what is being said. What shall be said. I want to make sure that I'm abiding by the proper time. We want to be able to leave here in another hour. Uh, and get there by 12, 12, 12, 15, 12, 30. Amen. 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 But you did have your Bibles turn with me to Revelation, to the book of Revelation. As we turn to the last book of the Bible, let me state to you right off and state it emphatically that God never intends to scare anybody. Mm -hmm. But just to be in his presence is going to cause you to tremble and shake because of his holiness, because of his power, because of who he is. He is God and we are not. When God descended on Mount Sinai to speak to Moses and to the children of Israel in Exodus chapter 19, the earth quaked. There was thunderings and lightning because God, that's his entourage, they always go before him, they're always around him. Thunders and lightnings, Matter of fact, when you read the book of Revelation, you will see that same picture again, that around the throne of God, there is lightning flashing, thundering, many, many voices. But the good thing about that, when he opens up his mouth, his voice drowns out all other voices. And so today, I want to talk to you just for a few moments about a scene in glory. I don't know about you, but I think about heaven and the occupants of heaven, about Jesus in heaven, how we're going to sing and shout and worship. One of the keys to understanding the book of Revelation is found in chapter 1, verse 19. If you want to understand the book of Revelation, it's not meant to scare you. It's really meant to show you that after all that happens here on this sinful and evil planet, God is God and that he's still in charge. John is on the island of Patmos having been sent there because of his testimony of Jesus Christ. While out there, he receives a vision from heaven and he's in the spirit as God informs him of the consummation of time and how eternity will begin. If you want to understand the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 19. Somebody read that for me. So write the things which you have seen in the vision and the things which are now happening and the things which will take place after these things. Now notice, he writes about that which is happening that would still happen. He, he takes all past, present, and future right there and tells John, you write this down. The book of Revelation, as it starts off in verse 1, is a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God the Father gave to the Son, and the Son gave to the servants, which are you and I, about how he's going to be worshipped, how his name will be proclaimed, how we are to honor God. And what you see here in the book of Revelation is that God pulls back the curtain of eternity and allows you and I to peek in to see how heaven operates, what it's all about. Matter of fact, if you want to know more about heaven, we don't really know all about heaven as we shall know but you'll get a good understanding of some things that do take place in heaven by reading the book of Revelation. Truth be told, if you read it, you're going to see seven beatitudes, seven blessings that go with reading just this last book itself. It says, blessed is the man who reads and understands this book. This book here, the 66th book of the Bible, Somebody tell you it's 67 books, they're lying to you. It's 66 books. 
The Bible is really all about Jesus Christ. One day, no matter who you are, what you achieve, what you got, you're going to stand before him and you're going to have to give an account to him. You're not going to be able to lie. You're not going to be able to hide behind mom or daddy. No achievements, no money. He's going to know your history better than you know it yourself. He's going to be able to separate those who know him from those who don't. Those who don't know him, as we have found out, will appear at the great white throne judgment, and those will be the people, as well as the angels, that shall be put into the bottomless pit, where they will spend an eternity in the midst of nothing but miserable woe and anguish. Jesus depicted as a person who will always be grinding his teeth and in, and in pain for an eternity. Well, how long, preacher, is the eternity? I don't know, because there is no end to it. Mm. There's no end to eternity. We have found out that as Christian believers, we will receive a reward at the bema seat of Christ well, he will judge us for the things that we have done in the body. Those things which are good and those things which are bad. That is not a judgment that will determine whether you go to hell or to heaven. If you're at the Bema seat of Christ, you're going to heaven. You're going to be in heaven. And you will spend an eternity with Jesus Christ. We have found out that there is going to be some rewards that are being handed out to individuals for those who really actually put Christ first and push themselves way back in the back. Because we live in a sinful and evil world, we don't hear a whole lot about the Bema seat. The old preachers used to say, the judgment bar of God where we will receive our rewards. And there's no greater reward than to be with Jesus Christ. But today, as we look at the book of Revelation, I want to talk about a scene in glory. Because when we read Revelation, you have to be able to follow the Spirit because he will take you to heaven. Then he'll say, okay, let's go back to earth. And it alternates back and forth, back and forth. There are things that are going to take place in heaven. What's going to take place, Petra? Not only are we going to receive our reward from Jesus Christ and be with him forever, but he's going to marry us. We are his bride and he is the bridegroom. And there will be only one wedding in heaven. And that, heaven, that, that wedding will be performed by God the Father uh, for his son and you and I as the church. The church, will, which has a while we're here on earth, we are the church militant. But one day we will be the church victorious. While we're here on planet earth, we are always fighting sin, sin, Satan, and even sometimes ourselves. But we are the church militant. When Jesus comes to fetch us, which is called the rapture, He's going to call us to meet him in midair. Now, if you ain't never flown before, and I know ain't none of us in here, we don't have wings. But by the power of his voice, he's going to call us up to meet all, all of us going to be called up to meet him in midair, where he will take us back to heaven to hand out rewards, to have a marriage that you ain't never even even and never could even imagine. And after that, tribulation will bust out here on earth. And that's when the Antichrist will show his ugly face. But today I want to really cue in on chapter four and five. Because in chapter four or five, John is given a scene in glory. Since I have such a little time, I want us to understand that as God goes back and forth, and as he shows John these things back, something going on in heaven, John? Okay, write that down. Something going on on earth, John? Write that down. So that they might know. And when you think about it, you got to understand that 
this must have brought John, who was out there on the island of Patmos, having been persecuted, they had tried to boil him alive so that he might die, but he did not die. That shows you the power of God, because God has life and death in his hand, which lets you know that if he wants you to stay alive, you're going to stay alive. That was just part of the suffering or the persecution that John would have to endure until he received this vision, this message from on high. But in chapter 4 or 5, you see a scene in glory. 17 times the word throne, T-H-R-O-N-E, is mentioned. And the reason why God kept talking about the throne and his throne was because during John's day, there were evil men who had set themselves upon the throne back on planet Earth, and they were persecuting Christians like you wouldn't believe. Now, you and I live in a country where we're not persecuted because of what we believe. But in John's time, they were being persecuted. They were being arrested, killed, jailed, misused, and abused. So God gives John this vision. And he says in chapter 4 and 5, he kept saying, throne, throne, my throne, throne. And so I want to talk to you just for four, a few minutes on this throne. Because if you read chapter 4 and 5, it's going to tell you something. Something that you and I would have to get to see. In chapter 4, there's a throne, and that throne is the throne of government. In chapter 5, it is a throne of grace. In chapter 4, Jesus is worshipped as the Lord of creation. In chapter 5, Jesus is worshipped as the Lamb out on Calvary's hill. In chapter 4, they sing a song that says, Thou art worthy, for thou hast created the world and everything our eyes see and don't see. In chapter 5, they sing a song again and say, Thou has been slain. That is the Lamb, that was Jesus, that was slain for my sins and your sins. And they sing a song, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, meaning that his precious blood dripped from Calvary's cross so that our sins may be washed away. Seventeen times that throne is mentioned just in these two short chapters. And the reason why God kept talking to John about throne is because he wanted John to understand that no matter what the affairs are happening here on earth, I am still on my throne as God the creator, God the redeemer, God the sustainer. And even in this evil day that you and I live where there are murders, where there are being people that are being misused, where there is division, where there is hatred, where there is so much going on, I just want to let you know that no matter what's going on in your house or even my house, God is on the throne. Yes, Lord. Amen. Can't move him off, can't shove him off, mm. can't replace him. Amen. He's on the throne no matter what the affairs are going on in this country or in any other country no matter who's in the White House or who's outside the White House God is on the throne yes Lord amen amen now it's a hard thing for us to understand and we scratch our head and this is a question that we ask that if God is on the throne and he is as good as we have heard people say in church and outside the church why is there so much evil happening in the world that he created, in the world that he redeemed, 
and in the world that you and I are now living in. Well, before you try to blame God for what's going on, take a mirror and look at yourself. Mm -hmm. No matter how you're dressed up, no matter what you wear, no matter how much you got in the bank, no matter where you live, the evilness that we see in the world is caused by sin, caused by Satan, caused by the sin that is in us. And we have to understand that God is blameless and that we are guilty. Even the best people that we might consider people who are good, and you know you hear that all the time on television, well he was a good person or she was a good person. See our definition of good, and I said this in Bible class, we have taken good above God and we just can't do that. Oh that was good what you did, oh that was good. No, any good that you and I might do it was because the Father put it in us so that we might do it for the glory of his Son. Amen. And we're going to be judged even for that good. And we're certainly going to be judged for the bad that we do too. There are some people that do good things but got bad thoughts. Why don't y'all say amen? amen? Because some of us have done it, ain't we? We've done something good, but in our mind and our heart. I really didn't want to do that, but I just had to do it. We got to be honest about ourselves. And so we are allowed to see God on the throne. Now, there's some things about the Lord sitting on the throne, and I'm just going to cover maybe one or two because there's seven mysteries that you'll find right here in chapter four and five about the throne. One of the first things you see is that there's a rainbow around the throne of God. Not like the rainbows that we see when it rains and after it rains, the rain stops. We see a rain, rainbow that circles around the area that we are. But the rainbow that you see in Revelation 4 and 5 is a complete rainbow. And the colors, are, now really if you count the colors of the rainbow that we can see with our natural eye, is seven colors. There we go, seven again. And this is one of the things about the book of Revelation. Well, notice that the rainbow that we see in Revelation, the rainbow is secular. It's just one complete circle, but it's one color. Mm. Amber. Mm -hmm. That was to show you and I that God has beauty all around him nothing but beauty. Now I know we can't really imagine that in our minds and in our hearts but it's so true. He has beauty around him. When you read chapter 4 and 5 there's another thing that you just will not believe. There is an incredible amount of people around the throne of God and they will all join in in one voice to sing praises unto the almighty God. The Bible says 10,000 times thousands of thousands. Now we can't, we don't have a math scale to even try to imagine just the number of the state. And the reason why he says 10,000 times thousands of thousands, he's trying to tell you that there's a number on God's math scale that humanity just cannot number. Right. Now get this. When God came and revealed himself to Abraham in, Gen in the Genesis record, he told Abraham that your seed will outnumber the stars that are in heaven. That's one. Then he came back and told him again that your seed will be greater than the sand pebbles on the seashore. Mm. Now, that's kind of that's that's great. I mean, how many can y'all can tell me how many pebbles of sand are on the seashore? How many of y'all can tell me how many stars that are in heaven? We only see with our natural eye star, some of the stars. But above the stars that we can see with our natural eye, there's a whole other dimension 
of other stars mm -hmm. that we just cannot count. And so what God says, around my throne that is encircled by the beauty of this amber rainbow, there is also an incredible amount of people. Not only people, but also angels. Because we have to understand that you and I have been created by God for God. You ain't been created for yourself. And you ain't never created your own. And you ain't, and I say this all the time. Nobody quite understands. You didn't pick the day of your birth. And you ain't going to pick the day of your death. You didn't pick your name. You didn't pick your color. You didn't pick your gender. All of that was chosen for you. And so what God wants you to understand. That has created. As the creator of this vast universe. That we never will quite understand. I sit on the throne. And it's all mine. And I've created it to bring me glory. And that's exactly what you and I have been created for. That's what exactly why you and I have been redeemed. That's exactly why we will spend an eternity with the Almighty. So in chapter 4, they praise God because he's the creator. In chapter 5, they praise him because he has redeemed us. And I'm saying Jesus to Christ because this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, one more thing, and I'm going to stop. You will see in chapter 4, 24 elders. And a lot of commentators and a lot of scholars have had difficulty trying to disseminate who are these 24 elders. Are they people or are they angels? What you and I have to understand is that we can only see with the natural eye. But there are some invisible beings that we cannot see unless God allows us to see it. And that's why I've, got, I've, I've tried to portray to you that there's an angel that's with you all the time. One of the reasons why the, uh, uh, the devil doesn't want a church to grow numerically that means that he would have to assign more evil demons to try to keep that church down. Mm. Whenever something happens in your life, uh, whether it's good or bad, there is an angel somewhere, and he's there to protect you. He's there to provide for you. A lot of times he is outranked mm. by something that is evil to bring you down. This is portrayed to us in the book of Daniel. Daniel had been praying and had been praying and fasting for 21 days. God dismissed an angel, but on the way to give Daniel the answer to what he had been praying for for 21 days, he had to stop in the, in the atmosphere and fight another angel. And he even tells Daniel, Daniel, from the time you started to pray, God already had dismissed me to answer your prayer. Mm. But I was held up by another angelic being. And the angelic being was more powerful than I am. So God had to dismiss Michael to fight the demon that was trying to keep me from telling you what God has to say. Mm. And what he had to tell Daniel was, Daniel, you are a much beloved man. God knows what you've been praying for. And this is the answer to the vision that God has given you. And so that lets you and I know, and it's not based upon your goodness, it's based upon God's grace. There are an innumerable amount of angels. And then in chapter 4 and 5, you will see an innumerable amount of spirit beings, which are you and I. You and I do not get to heaven. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We are spirit beings also, but on a dimension lower than the angels. But they are our ministering spirits to us. They do what God tells you them to do. They will never accept you bowing down to them. Now, I'm going to leave you with this, and I'll stop. Because we don't quite get into this angelic thing as we should. Amen. We don't think the angels <clears throat> We thank the God who sent the angel. Amen. Let me say that again. We don't thank the angel. 
we thank God who sent the angel. And so the angel will tell you that. If you, if you see an angel one day and you bow down, the first thing he'll tell you, get up. That does not belong to me. Only bow to God. Over and over again in the Bible, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I'm going to show you this when we get over to this next church. Over and over again, when an angel is told to go and deliver a message to one of God's people, the first thing it brings is terror mm -hmm. into the lives and minds of the person because of its flashiness as an angel that appears like lightning. Is always white. There are, there are many different types of angels. I know the seraphim, the cherubims. But there are angels who war, and then there are angels who deliver messages. There are warring angels, and then there are messenger angels. Now let me give you an illustration. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. 40 days and 40 nights. After Jesus defeated the temptation of the devil, which let you know that it lasted for 40 days and 40 nights, the Bible tells us that angels came to minister to him. Now I want you to imagine this. When they came to minister to him, what do you think their posture was? They fell down. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he is God. Yes. He is their creator. They bow down. Mm -hmm. We're going to encourage you. We're going to strengthen you. And we're going to bless you and keep you going on this journey. Now, because an angel is a ministering spirit, we have human beings who will encourage us, but we also have angelic beings who will encourage us. All through the Bible, you see particular angels who will come and minister to the human being because that's what they are supposed to do. And they will encourage the human beings that we are to keep going in the Lord's name. Elijah, one of the prophets of God, was in war against the enemy of Israel. And his servant came and said, Master, Master, we're circled. We've been circled by our enemies and they've come to get us. And Elijah the prophet said, God, open up his eyes so that he may see. Yeah. And God opened up his eyes, and around the enemy that had encircled them, there was angelic beings that had encircled yes. his enemies. Yeah. That was to encourage him. You're on the right track. You're doing what I tell you to do. We are under the divine protection of the almighty God. We cannot take that for granted. But that is meant for us to thank God for blessing us in spite of our shortness, our weaknesses, and our selfishness. I'm going to stop right there. Because this next little abbreviated sermon that I'm going to preach about, you're going to see an angel come and deliver a message. And he's going to come twice. And he's going to tell a woman, you're going to conceive a son. And this son is going to be a Nazarite from birth. Who you think that is? Samson. Mm -hmm. We don't even know Samson's mother's name. He's just, she's just titled as the wife of Manoah. But twice, that angel is going to tell her, this is what you got to do. Don't you drink no wine. Don't you drink, keep the dietary laws. Now, well, you're going to, you've been trying to have a baby, mm -hmm. but now you're going to have one. But that baby will be a blessing unto you and your people to deliver Israel out of the hands of their enemies. Notice that the angel delivered the message, the command by God. She runs and tells her, hum her husband, baby, an angel that appeared to me. And this is what he told me. And he said, well, wait a minute. How come he came to you and didn't come to me? I'm the head of the household because that's what God can do. I'm going to stop right there. We're in right here because we, we got some other things to say to the men over there at Ministry of the Courage. Shall we pray our eternal God and our Father? Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace. We thank you for your loving arms of protection. 
We thank you for the provision that you provided for us. It's not by our strength, it's not by our wisdom, it's not by our knowledge, but it's by your love and your grace and your love and grace alone. And we honor you, kind Father, for the gift of your Son. Help us to accept this knowledge, to receive this knowledge, that we may see that you and you alone are worthy of all praise and all honor. Thank you for the throne that you sit upon. And now, God, we pray that you sit upon the throne of our hearts, the throne of our lives, and that you be first as we seek the kingdom of God first in all of its righteousness and proclaim your name to those who are lost in this sinful and dying world in which we live in. Bless now as only you can and we. In the mighty name of our Christ, do we ask these blessings as he rules and reigns across this universe. In Christ Jesus' name, for his glory, do we ask this. Amen and amen. Let's sing a song. Let's hear it on out and eat some food and go.